expertise event, which is fully funded by the Department of Energy, Security and Net Zero, delivered by Turner and Townsend. I will now hand over to Claire to start today's presentation. Massive thank you, Mia. Um, really lovely introduction. Thank you very much. And welcome to everyone um, today for joining us for this Climate Resilience and uh, Social Housing uh, Masterclass. If this is your first time, very much welcome to this. If you're, you've been to lots of our masterclasses, welcome back. Always nice to um, see lots of familiar faces, so that's really fantastic. This session, we're really going to be thinking about climate resilience as a topic, but also in the context of social housing. We're going to be looking at why this is important, and we'll be looking at some of the key issues for social housing. We'll have a quick look at a, a little case study at the end who of an RP who has made climate resilience part of their strategy. Um, and we'll go through lots of different things. So if you do have queries or questions, um, please do um, use the chat function. Um, I will try and answer them as we go along, but we'll also have plenty of time at the end um, for people to ask questions and queries. And also share some of your um, examples and your experience as well. That's always uh, really appreciated. So let's start at the beginning. Let's really think about what it is when we're talking about climate resilience. So when we're thinking about climate resilience, what we're thinking about is those risks that are being posed towards housing infrastructure and how we can absolutely look at being more resilient when facing those increased issues. We know that this is one of the biggest challenges that we are all facing and we know from science that there are long-term changes in our climatic system, including temperature changes, precipitation and sea level um, changes. So hopefully you can see on um, the um, slide that we've got two kind of charts to really help understand what this looks like because sometimes it's really hard to visualize what this actually means. So the chart on the left, these are both taken from the Met Office, so you can go and have a look at some of their data and some of their information, is around UK annual temperature. So having a look at where we are now in terms of the, the gauge. So you'll hopefully be able to see that on the right hand side of that, that we are experiencing some of the hottest years on record. The chart on the right is also about this long term tracking um, of the global mean temperature difference. All the different um, elements on that chart are taken from different Earth observatories. So they are, are not connected, they are separate. And they show the, a very similar trend in terms of the temperature changes that we are noting. One of the key things about climate resilience is understanding the information, understanding the trends, and seeing that we are experiencing a, a change in temperature is absolutely part of that. When we think about climate resilience, we are thinking about the impact it's having on society. If we are seeing more droughts and more severe weather, we know personally how we are experiencing that. We are ex uh, seeing things like, um, you know, increased flooding events, increased uh, water scarcity, lots and lots of different impacts and will vary depending on where you are in the country. If we look at a kind of a definition, the Centre of Climate and Energy Solutions talk about it in the ability to prepare for, recover from and adapt to those impacts. So when we're thinking about social housing, absolutely, we're understanding that it's about preparing for this, recovering from, having that adaptation piece as well. Absolutely, we see that Climate resilient development, so that might be new build or retrofit projects, has become the new paradigm in sustainable development and absolutely is going to need to be a priority in anyone's strategy going forward um, in our country. So let's have a quick look in terms of why it's going to be important. So we've touched on the fact that actually temperatures are changing. We know from a global context that they have particularly risen rapidly in the last 50 years. When we go back to data, and again, I, I re-emphasise this point that it's really important to get robust, clear and transparent data. I always like to go to the UK Met Office. They have significant amounts of data and information that we can use. By 2070, so that's a reasonably long way away, but actually it'll probably come quicker than we think. Winters at 2070 will be between one and four and a half degrees warmer and 30% wetter. So we're seeing that actually there will be a warmer level, but also we'll see this precipitation issue. 
What we see as well in summers in 2070, that will be between one and six degrees warmer and up to 60 percent drier. So again, if we are experiencing warmer temperatures, that can lead to um, significant challenges within our portfolios, not just on the infrastructure, but on the people that are in, in those homes. If we look at kind of average temperature, 30 degrees plus six degrees, 36 degrees is a significantly higher temperature than most of us are probably used to. That prolonged kind of heat wave, so when we have a, a, a long period of heat, absolutely a risk to health and we know from data that they cause excessive deaths particularly among elder um, people where we see issues around precipitation and where we see increased rainfall that can absolutely link to um, more flooding events so again if you have properties within your portfolio that you know lower lying that are close to rivers or to streams or are coastal we know that this is potentially going to be a challenge to those properties and how they're going to be able to cope with the increasing impacts of climate change. Climate resilience is so important. We see it in a number of ways coming through in terms of the impacts as a registered provider, as a landlord, and those extreme weather events absolutely are becoming more kind of frequent in their occurrence. So seeing periods of, of time when we have significantly higher wind speeds, that can cause damage to properties. It can prevent people travelling to certain places. When we think about climate change impact, we also have to think about things around food security. If that is disrupting the process, we can absolutely have a challenge potentially with food security. And that will absolutely impact us, but also our residents and tenants in our in our homes. Damage to infrastructure, you only have to kind of use an internet search engine to kind of see various impacts of roads not being passable, train lines buckling under extreme heat, train lines being flooded, preventing lots of kind of people getting to and, and from where they need to be. And also that kind of long term damage as well, meaning that investment will then need to be made in theirs, as well as things like biodiversity and health. Um, there will be a significant impact on the ecosystems that we um, experience and that we can kind of see if we have those changes. Different habitats um, might become more scarce, as well as the ability for us to enjoy those spaces. So that mental health um, acts, access to green spaces is going to be a challenge that actually we need to think about how, as a social landlord or a social landlord's housing provider, how can we kind of take account for this in any of our strategies? So when we look at it, we kind of think that a lot of the homes that we are building, that we have built, that we have taken on board within our portfolios, um, have been built not with climate change in mind. There will probably be some examples in your portfolio where absolutely that has been part of it. But generally, it is something that has only recently been prioritised. When we look at the UK social housing stock, this is absolutely exacerbated by the, the lack of supply of new homes, which are built to better um, in energy performance standards, but also thinking about um, that overheating element. So if you're familiar with the building regulations, we now have part O, um, which is overheating. So any property that is being built must adhere to that, that part of the building regulations, as well as the other elements. We know that there are a lot of vulnerable people who live in social housing. Those vulnerabilities are exacerbated by the impacts of climate change. So again, heightening that risk level to those people about the impact it's likely to have on them. So bringing all of that together, absolutely, social landlords have a, um, a, a big challenge ahead in terms of adapting the homes in your portfolio, both in terms of energy efficiency, but also addressing climate resilience and how it should be this golden thread going through to make sure that we have suitable homes, which absolutely are going to be safe and secure for our residents and our tenants. So let's have a look at a little bit more of some of the details. Um, I do love a, a really nice image. And again, this is taken from the Met Office. So please do feel free to, to go and have a look at some of the, the more details of some of the, the research that they've done around this topic. So this image is from the Met Office and it highlights the drivers, changes and impacts of climate change. And when we're thinking about how to address these, we need to 
really consider the impact shown here, particularly in that outer circle. Particularly, I want to draw people's attention to issues around heat stress, damage to infrastructure, and particularly flooding, because those ones are really closely linked to um, social housing. There are other ones, and absolutely we shouldn't ignore the other ones, but just as a kind of highlight for you today to really think about those those kind of key impacts that we will we will certainly be seeing more of um, as the cl impacts of, of climate change are more felt. We already know that the UK has some of the poorest performing homes um, in Europe. We also know that we have a shortage of homes. Current numbers, and I'm sure these will be updated at some point, um, but over over a million households are waiting for social housing. And what we need is that mix of improving the homes that we have, but also really appreciating that actually we also have a need for new homes as well. We need to ensure that homes are built to be resilient to the changing climate, not just right right in the moment, but also for 2050 and beyond, when significant changes in temperature and precipitation will be much more evident. By addressing these issues now, we can absolutely consider the social benefits with improvements to homes. And this is kind of one of the, the key things that we need to be really thinking about. Summer 2022, so two years ago, saw um, record-breaking heat, wa heat waves with temperatures reaching above 40 degrees C for the first time in July. By 2035, the Met Office predict that these temperatures could become the average in summer. So not something that is unexpected, but the average. Homes in particular, and especially in the southeast and in cities, so cities um, uh, like Leeds, Birmingham, Manchester, also um, are likely to experience this, are more likely to experience overheating during the summer, which can absolutely increase mortality rates um, that we see. And this is a real challenge for us in, in, in social housing to make sure that we are taking that consideration as part of our strategy for our assets that we are holding. If you have had a look at the English Housing Survey, um, if you haven't, I'd really advise you to go and have a look at that. Going back a couple of years, so 2018, found that 15% of all English living rooms overheated and 19% of English bedrooms overheated. So again, highlighting that different different rooms in a property can experience different levels. So again, providing a opportunity to address it, but also a challenge where we have uh, particularly restrictive, um, particularly archetypes. So when we're thinking about it, there are some options in terms of how we can address this, particularly looking at overheating, an increase of extreme weather, particularly around heat, is going to be a challenge. But Thankfully, there are a variety of different solutions and measures that we can think of and get designed, get appropriately assessed for our projects to make sure that we are thinking about climate resilience in our retrofit project. So these are just some examples. Um, you might have some other examples that you um, are aware of and absolutely um, please do share those. It's always appreciated. So things like green roofs and um, having that level of um, vegetation suitably designed on a load bearing property can really see um, significant um, prevention of that overheating risk. Same with cross ventilation. So this is where you have, say, a window at the front of the property and a window at the back of the property. If those are both then openable, um, that ventilation and that movement of air can kind of push that kind of warmer air out and bring in fresh, fresher air. Obviously, in particular times of um, significant overheating, you don't want to have those windows open because it'll let it in. But being having having that as part of your kind of regime in kind of purging that, that hot, particularly um, after sunset, can be a really useful opportunity. Thinking about shading as well, internal and external, so curtains closed in the in, in peak hours um, to prevent that heat from coming in, but also things like external shading, shutters, um, overhangs. Implementing these as part of the regime can be a really useful uh, activity for certain properties and also in terms of advising uh, residents and tenants about activities that they can undertake. And then we come on to insulation. 
Absolutely. If we are improving the fabric of our properties, we are going to see that that thermal performance is going to be elevated. And what we mean in terms of this is that movement of transfer of heat. So if we are insulating the roof, if we are insulating the, the walls in, in particular, we are adding more thermal mass to those. Those can absolutely help support um, addressing potential areas of overheating obviously have to be designed appropriately with a suitably qualified designer for that. We also have the kind of the extreme. So when we talk about extreme weather, we can also talk about in terms of temperature. And that includes extreme of cold temperatures. We know from lots and lots of data, you might know on the call in terms of experiences that you have with certain homes within your portfolio, that living in a cold home can absolutely worsen respiratory illness, mental health issues, and have significant detrimental impacts on the well-being of that um, resident. We also know from data from the NHS, so the National Health Service, that there is 1.4 billion spent on treating illnesses associated with poor housing. So that includes cold and damp. We also know that with kind of prolonged periods of storm, of cold, that as we go through in terms of climate change, we are more likely to see these occur as a regular occurrence rather than one off events. So it being part of any strategy, any kind of climate engagement piece and um, discussions with tenancy teams is going to be really important in understanding those those potential impacts. So again, like with overheating, um, there are some measures that we can um, think about in terms of our retrofit project with our asset management improvements and, and uh, proactive um, addressing is we can think about how we can make these improvements so that any occurrence of extreme cold can be managed, it can be dealt with, and the tenant or resident in there is still going to be able to maintain that really nice level of thermal comfort. So certainly things like um, more modern heating systems, and these come in an absolute variety of different, um, different options. So we can have uh, mechanical ventilation and heat recovery, heat pumps, electric panels, infrared heating, and, and a whole heap of other, uh, other elements. So really thinking about what is going to be the appropriate way of heating that space for the benefit of that resident. Um, lots of lots of different issues. And again, make sure that it is designed appropriately and um, that you're linking in the maintenance teams as well, because if something goes wrong, it's making sure that you have the capability and capacity to fix any challenges um, with new heating systems. We also have the benefit around wall insulation and roof insulation. So, again, thinking about how we can improve the fabric of the structure to enable um, the property to stay at a suitable temperature for the residents and the tenants and not allowing that cool in, which is what we can often feel. So those drafty areas, um, I'm sure um, you all have had lots of feedback from some tenants that that's what they're experiencing. So insulating properly and addressing those issues can really help with the challenge of extreme cold. Linked to kind of heating, cooling, we have this issue of flooding. Whilst it isn't necessarily a, a, a direct link, what we see that if um, an area is flooded, that can lead to um, significant stress points. If a flooding event does occur, it can lead to actual physical damage of properties, also connecting infrastructure. Um, it can significantly lead to real challenge points in terms of stress, particularly as a building without people is just a building, but you add people for somewhere they can live, it becomes a home. That sentimental attachment can be really, really a stressful point um, for anyone who has experienced a, a flooding event. It can lead to disruption of family life and potentially that community cohesion within the locality of where that has happened. It can also have detrimental impacts on mental health and on physical health as well. You only have to kind of have a look at some uh, recent examples where raw sewage has ended up being, re being kind of released into that flood water and ending up in people's homes. 
the impacts of kind of inhaling that and being kind of exposed to that can be really challenging um, and should be something to be um, uh, appreciated and, and noted, particularly if you are, you know, already you're in a flooding area, absolutely utilise the flood maps that you can get from the Environment Agency to understand that um, as well. It's so important to understand the measures in terms of preventing flooding, those that are suitable for kind of within the home, but in that wider estate, within the locality. There might already be flood defences that have been recently installed in your area, um, but it's understanding what will happen in the event of a flood um, to those um, particular areas. But it's also when we are doing um, large scale projects to really think about improving drainage systems um, in the um, in, a, in the country. We have you know a really great drainage system. You know, we have one in some areas. It's quite old. So thinking about how we can improve that, particularly for surface water flooding. So on periods of kind of high rain, it can be really useful to do estate walk arounds and see maybe where block drains exist and that surface area area water isn't draining into that and being taken away it might be pooling um, and that's a really useful exercise to undertake but also understanding about the alerts that people can have and just being aware that actually flood risk in a lot of areas will increase when we think about it, so like with the others, we've looked at it in terms of options to kind of consider what we can do to um, prevent the occurrence of impact of flooding onto the properties that within our portfolio. Um, and absolutely, those extreme weather events, which are due to climate change, um, can lead to challenge. Like I said before, you know, we do have a drainage system, but when that capacity is met or it is more than the expected capacity, this is when we can see um, significant challenges. So thinking about it for your portfolio and whether that's you've got 10 properties or you've got 25,000, there will be different measures that will be suitable. You might already have some really nice examples installed. And again, really happy if people would like to share those at the end. But things like rain gardens, so these are spaces that are specifically designed to prevent that rain or water from going into the drainage system. So vegetation absolutely has this amazing capacity to absorb water and kind of prevent that, um, that overspill of water. Green roofs as well, so not only from a overheating perspective, but also from a flooding. Again, something to absorb that water and prevent it from getting into the drainage system is going to be an option to consider. Things like permeable paving as well, not having a solid level of um, paving that exists that prevents the water from draining into um, the kind of the subsoil, but having something that can um, go forward and go and and kind of um, be drained, and so preventing that step of it ending up in the in, in the drainage. If you are doing projects that look at some kind of driveways, for example, um, that's a really nice opportunity to explore um, to kind of prevent that area being being a particular challenge and, and a hot spot of, of, of extra runoff. There's also things called sustainable drainage systems or SUDs, so sustainable urban drainage systems, which are much more kind of a, a, a wider scheme to really think about where water could go. Um, there are lots of examples where there are kind of green spaces that have kind of gullies, that there are um, ponds that the water can then drain into rather than it going into a, a, a drainage system. It can also help with biodiversity elements as well if you have these more natural spaces that are there to be designed for flood but actually have these wonderful benefits around biodiversity as well. So let's have a look at a, a case study. We really like to have a look at different examples of what people are already doing, because um, it gives us a nice insight in terms of seeing what the possible is. So here we have a, an example. Um, it's from uh, Hammersmith and Fulham. One of our colleagues actually uh, in the RISE team was involved in this project. So it's a really nice um project to uh, kind of um, discuss. So there were three 
social housing estates in Hammersmith and Fulham, which they really thought about in terms of the um, climate resilient and, and really putting it into, we need to have this resilience. How are we going to do this? And they were highlighted because they were in critical drainage areas. So again, we have thought about it in the context of increased precipitation and potential for flood risk. And particularly for these estates that were highlighted, the surface water drainage, so that is water that falls from the sky and then has to go somewhere. Um, this isn't like a, a fluvial, so a river, a stream um, uh, or coastal. They drained directly into the combined sewer. So in this country, we have surface water, but we also have foul. And a combined sewer takes both of those. So a bit of a challenge. The combined sewer service was uh, kind of fed through gullies, which again, um, if blocked, if not properly maintained, really kind of highlighted the risk of, of surface flooding. So that is where we have that excess of water and it and it can't go somewhere. So it just finds the easiest path. Um, that might be into someone's home. It might be into car parking. It might be into the substation. All of these things um, can be real challenges. So what they did is they really thought about how to do it and what options were available to them. And for this example, they went for a variety of sustainable urban drainage systems, which were installed across the three estates that had been highlighted. Um, and they included a whole range of different things. So absolutely, they utilised um, green roofs. So that is where you have um, a, a membrane and then a layer of very kind of um, small, low lying vegetation is is installed in the soft landscaped areas that existed on these estates. They absolutely installed um, rain gardens as well. So specifically designed to capture that water in times of heavy rain for the benefit of the vegetation, but also to kind of divert that that rainfall. It was also part of the project to waterproof a lot of the homes, which is a, a, a real kind of interesting element, and also insulation upgrades to those properties as well. They also utilised tree pits to really think about how can we divert this water that is, is, is very likely to fall on our properties to the benefit. So the trees on the estate um, had this kind of improved tree pit um, location and they also had permeable paving as well. So that implementation of um, surfaces that didn't kind of ignore the water, but allowed it to trickle into the subsoil. Some of the details that, that come out of this um, are, are really, really interesting to kind of have a look at. They found that 100% of the rain falling on those impermeable surfaces was now being collected by those measures and diverting it away from those um, weak drainage systems. So a real positive impact there as well as the flow meters. So um, again, when we're doing a retrofit project, we want to do maintenance and evaluation and monitoring. Here, they installed flow meters um, and noticed a 98% drop in peak water flow due to some of those measures. They've highlighted green roofs here, but it was very much a, a cumulative one as well. The green roofs also were noted as in terms of aiding and combating local urban cooling particularly noticing that for those homes that didn't have the green roof installed, they measured 15 degrees warmer compared with the green roof. And also this issue around biodiversity. So um, improving um, the biodiversity on the estates led to an estate which supported 64 different species. So again, if you have a biodiversity strategy or it's part of your sustainability strategy around increasing biodiversity on the properties in your portfolio, this is a really nice example in terms of some really nice successes um, that they've seen. They also had some really nice additional outcomes. And I think when we're thinking about projects, and, and this, this is also for retrofit projects, is when we have those other benefits that we find. So things like community engagement, so community residential uh, engagement, absolutely were given the um, opportunity to talk about the improvements to be made. It also highlighted with the community the discussions and awareness about the impacts of climate change. 
particularly for people on that estate. So they've taken the issue of flooding and really elevated the um, the understanding and the awareness of those um, people on the on those estates in terms of what was being done and the reasons behind it as well. So a, a real nice element here. They also addressed issues around inequality, um, and I really like those. Surface flooding has a, a massive impact on those who have limited um, accessibility um, or kind of um, they have certain mobility issues. So certainly it was a project that was able to think about this in terms of how can we make it better for people to effectively escape, but also not then need to escape as much because they were putting in these steps to improve the likelihood um, of a surface water event. So again, um, that equality issue is a really nice um, outcome that has, has been addressed in part by this by this project. As well as education and training, we know that there are, you know, massive opportunities for um, training and development within retrofit projects. Um, but for this one, it was really nice to see that Groundwork London were one of the partners and they provided training to young unemployed people um, who installed um, a lot of um, the SUDS measures themselves and ultimately resulted in them getting a qualification. So in this circumstance, it was the level one cities and guild in practical horticulture skills. So starting those people off on, on a journey that will hopefully lead them to um, have really sustained jobs um, in that kind of um, area. So some other outcomes of the programme, which are really nice to, to highlight to you. So we'll bring together all of those elements we've, we've kind of looked at and thought about. Um, we know that it's a pressing issue in terms of dealing with climate change and within our portfolios. Absolutely, we are aware that prolonged heat waves are a risk to health. Everyone on this call, you know, it has an impact on, on us. We all have different thermal kind of levels that we like to be at. Um, some of you will love to be warmer. Some of you will, will prefer to be a bit cooler. And that prolonged heat can be a challenge to us working in retrofit and social housing, as well as the tenants um, and colleagues that we work with. So it's really important to, to think about and to um, address with this. Flooding absolutely has a significant impact on residents living in social housing. But there are a wide range of solutions that we can implement to reduce that impact of climate change within the sector. And making sure that it is part of that organisational strategy is going to be really essential in making sure that it is addressed. I always like to share some resources with you. So I've talked about the Met Office. Absolutely go and have a look at their climate resilience pages. There's some really nice data there that you can use in kind of feeding back to colleagues. Um, the UN has some uh, really interesting pieces as well, um, particularly around um, climate adaptation and some lessons learned from other countries. Um, we also have kind of climate resilience and why it matters. And then there is the UK Climate Resilience Programme. So again, all of those websites are going to hopefully be useful to you in terms of understanding, but also sharing that awareness with colleagues. We do have some more masterclasses via RISE. So we have the Understanding Climate Change for Housing Providers, um, which is next week. Um, we also have some of the more technical elements. So we've got a managing technical risks, as well as embedding social value into retrofit projects. So that piece around um, the training that was offered um, to those unemployed um, people on the example I just shown is a really nice of that social value piece. So those are three ones to have a look at they won't there are lots and lots of lots more uh, examples what we also would like to highlight to you is when we're coming up to to future opportunities if you would like to receive direct support from rise this is a uh, self-assessment form for you to complete but it's also an opportunity to explore how to develop the program further so if there are areas that you would like to see more support in and um, please absolutely do let us know with that 
And then it's just last to uh, kind of um, say thank you so much for coming. It's always a pleasure. If you would like to email us, uh, my email address is on there. We also have a rise at turntown.co.uk um, email address. Um, and we have the website as well, which is riseretrofit.org.uk, where you can find loads of information, um, more of the details in terms of the resources and links to upcoming events that you would be absolutely welcome to to join us at.